Uh, Joseph Asario is going to talk to us about uh, a non-CME portion of the program where he's going to discuss predictive analytics and patient-specific rods and how they can be potentially integrated into your practice. Uh, and I've seen this talk before. It's really a, a, a very innovative and, and compelling, uh, compelling talk to listen to. So I'd appreciate uh, Joseph continuing forward with this. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Chris. I appreciate the kind introduction. Uh, thanks to all the chairpersons and also to Medtronic for the opportunity to talk. The next 15 minutes, I want to share really um, predictive analytics and patient-specific rods, specifically as it relates to my deformity practice. Here are my disclosures. When I'm referring to patient-specific rods, I am referring to the Metacrea rods or the unit rods as they are named. I'm going to highlight the predictive analytics uh, and define it. I'm going to go through the workflow and then I'm going to share three cases. So when you think about your daily life, how many of you have gone to a consumer website and you've seen recommended items? And often you'll see them and you, you, you think to yourself, gosh, that's, that's spot on to exactly what I want to see. That's predictive analytics. What about when you're driving to work and you, you type in or you're going to a different location and you type in your app, that location, you see three different routes, you see the fastest route, and you notice that over the last few years, this accuracy has gotten even better and better. And then as you think about when you go to Google and you type in a search word or phrase, you don't even have to complete the entire word before right away Google gets it right. And in reality, machine learning and predictive analytics are an integral part of our daily lives. And you can even see in the bottom corner here in the Google that predictions and predictive modeling is something that they, they frequently do use. So what are predictive analytics? It really is using data, an abundance of data, together with statistical models in order to make a prediction. And so when we look at the development of the unit rod, it really starts back in 2013. The Schwab classification is so important and integral to our development, our understanding around deformity cases. And then in 2014, Mo et al. did describe that the spinal pelvic alignment was often at times inadequately corrected. And really we have to pay attention to the proximal thoracic correction, which is often missed. And in 2014, unit rods were approved, but it wasn't until 2017 where the model was started and they started to predict thoracic kyphosis and proximal thoracic compensation. And so when we think about predictive analytics in spine, certainly you have a patient like this who I'll present who this is what you want to avoid. But in reality, predictive analytics, although it's a hot topic in spine, there's very little implementation in actual surgery. Currently in the literature, most of what we're seeing is really around risk stratification and patient selection. Um, and so I'll spend this time really talking about Metacrea and how you can, you can utilize predictive analytics in the operating room at the time of surgery. Some of the early data in adult deformity using these unit rods show on the left non-PSO cases, adult deformity cases having rod fracture rates that are down from 9% down to 2.2%. And in three-column osteotomy cases, a rod fracture rate decreased from 22% to 4.7%. And really, this, this cycle is, is an important one to understand. So if you start at the top right, number one, it all starts with an image analysis, getting the measurements, understanding the spinal pelvic parameters. And then once you um, provide your case strategy, a simulation is made, the implant, which is patient-specific and personalized, is shipped. And after the case, the data is collected in the sense that what did you do during the case and what do the post-operative films actually show? And then it's a circuitous process in the sense that then it circles back around and that gets fed back into the model. I mentioned that data is integral and very important to this. And there's about 6,000 surgeries um, currently that have been logged and used and about 200 a month. And so really this continuous cycle of improvement is, is really where it's at. So how does it work? Um, as a schematic, you have a patient who has an X-ray and then the model is trying to make a prediction of that proximal thoracic kyphosis, those gray um, anatomical structures that you see there. And then in the model, all the parameters are actually fed in, and then you get a prediction of what, what you think the actual proximal thoracic kyphosis is in order to really mitigate a failure. And so then you use your post-operative x-ray and see how different that is from your plan, pre-op. And so that's a situation where it might work well. What happens when you have too much lordosis and it doesn't work well? Well, that information also gets fed into, into this cycle. 
and that will impact the next set of plans. And when you can see here, this is what the actual plan looks like. You have a pre-op, a plan A, plan E, plan C. Those plans really depend on what you want to see. So you can, you can submit one plan, you can submit several plans. If you want to see what it, the case would look like with a three column or without a three column, going to the upper thoracic or maybe stopping in the lower thoracic as a UIV, you can see all of those curves before selecting your final approved plan. Now, I'm thinking about rod placement. I think back to my, my training, um, and early as a resident, I remember seeing cases where I would hear, gosh, we don't have enough rod. Now, that still isn't going in. Or Why isn't the reduction tool working? Let's get a new rod out. And, and this is a funny picture that, was, that we took um, as a junior resident of a rod that was wasted. But you could imagine during this case, putting in this rod that ultimately did not go in added time, frustration, surgeon stress. And let alone think about the patient that could have potentially been locked into this contour. This is the unit rod um, for one of my cases. Certainly, I've noticed that it saves time. Certainly, there's reduction in frustration and de decreased surgeon stress. But also, I'm locking the patient into a predicted outcome that is hopefully improving their alignment, and it's the correct alignment. So how does this work? There are several steps. The ones that I've highlighted in yellow um, in the middle are really the only time I have to uh, interact with the actual algorithm as a preparatory step towards the case. So you have an x-ray, and then Metacrea does the measurements, and then you come up with the plan, and once you submit that plan, you approve it, and after the case, there's a wrap-up in the sense that you provide the information of what you actually did, and then the post-operative films are involved in the data analysis. So these are screenshots from my cell phone. I do many of these plannings in clinic right on my cell phone, and you can see that after I have the measurements, I will choose the UIV and LIV uh, in the planning stage right on my phone, and I submit, and then I see the curve. And then if I'm happy with that, I approve it. So I want to go through three cases. Uh, the first is that Schuerman's kyphosis case. So it's a 29-year-old man. He has Schuerman's kyphosis. At 18, he had a correction from T4 to L3. He had pain, hardware pullout, and the surgeon removed the, the bottom two levels. And as you can imagine, he developed a significant iatrogenic deformity. And you can see when he presented to me here in 2020, he had 92 degrees of, of a kyphotic deformity. You still use all of your normal um, imaging modalities in order to make the decision. So CT, MRI, I'm paying attention on the CT to the unfused disc at the apex. I look at all the sagittal parameters. You can see his SVA here was measured at 20 centimeters. And so I'm really going to leverage that apex in those unfused discs with type 2 osteotomies, low-grade osteotomies. And so how does this look in, on my phone when I'm typing in a plan? It really takes less than a minute. So looking here, all I have to do is do the drop down for the UIV, the LIV, and then simply at the very bottom there, I can type in where will my PCOs be? Or if I'm gonna do any inner bodies, where will that take place? And what they suit back is, is, a, is a plan. And so here, I share this case because when I looked at this plan, I wanted to get more correction. And so there's an easy way to interact with the engineer on the chat function. Or I can say, can you please increase the, the degrees? I, I actually feel like I probably will achieve more. And here you can see we went through a cycle. And finally, I was happy with this film here. And this is what was shipped. And here's the final outcome. And I think for, for this patient, clinical pictures is really, it really shows how remarkable of an outcome he had. He's actually someone who was taller than me. And so this, this highlights it well. But here's his AP and lateral films and really a great clinical outcome. Case two is a more common sort of degenerative spinal deformity, 70-year-old man who had progressive decline in walking, um, and he had neurogenic claudication. And so here's his standing films. You can see the calibration sphere that we use, um, and that's in order to, to get the correct uh, length of the rods with metacrea. Here are all the sagittal parameters, and, and I just highlight the fact that his SVA is 15 centimeters, but here our radiologist in the film that's saved in our, in our PAC system shows that he had measured it at 16 centimeters, just to highlight the point that we often measure our own x-rays, but this is nice in the sense that it's automated and it's consistent. I went up to T9 because he did have a level of stenosis there. And for me, this was a two-stage operation. At the bottom there, you see that I do use transition rods and I usually stagger them around the thoracolumbar junction. I type in my plan. And when I look at the actual um, outcome here, you can actually see there's a lot embedded in this picture. You can, you can see where the transitions are, you can see the UIV, LIV, how much is um, being accounted for for each PCO, as well as the inner body efforts. And then the plan shows me where we'll lie. And if I, 
accept that plan. And you can see here's the outcome and the clinical outcome. And it actually looks quite similar to the, um, to the planned unit rod. And then you can follow this patient longitudinally. So here's his four, four month post-op measurements, which we continue to follow. And obviously at the end of the case, are we done? Well, no, you have to feed back to the engineers what you actually did. And so this is the sheet for this patient. And you can see, you wanna highlight exactly what you did in terms of cages. Did you use them? Did you not? Did you actually do the intended osteotomy that you had planned? And then what about, are you satisfied? Did you do any rod cutting or bending? You can tell in this case, I really, I really did not have to modify the rod at all. But there are cases where I do. Um, I'll tell you that this day and age with these rods, I rarely have to use any sagittal benders, but I do use coronal benders. And this case highlights that. So this is idiopathic scoliosis patient who's 49 years old with uh, 51 degrees and 57 degrees of scoliosis. You can see he's imbalanced with the 6.6 .6 centimeter sagittal imbalance. And for him, I ended up also doing a two-stage operation and taking him down to the pelvis uh, with the T3 to ilium. But here's, here's a case where I do manipulate the rod and I do use the vertebral column manipulators and coronal benders. So many of the, the corrective techniques that we use as deformity surgeons, you still do end up using, but it, the, really the leverage is in the sagittal plane. I still use uh, 3D printed models and freehand my pedicle screws. And here's the outcomes for this patient. So really in conclusion, predictive analytics in my mind are, are here to stay. Uh, personalized rods truly save time. I see it that it does save time. Here's a, a, a video um, live which shows me placing the right and left rods in the T10 to ilium in, in 13 minutes for both rods combined, which really has saved me significant time. Um, I also think that it's Im impacting outcomes and we're starting to see that in the early data. Thank you, everyone.